So up to this point, we've started to figure out how to make covalent molecules fit to get electrons to be shared from one kind of valence energy level to another in order to get everything to be happy, either with an octet or otherwise some noble gas configuration like a duet. So we share electrons over. Uh, in this case, I'm not showing the electrons kind of around these outer atoms here, just kind of worrying about this middle guy. Um, but what we haven't really covered yet is how we get these kind of odd shapes of molecules that don't always seem to be intuitive. So to start, let's look at one that kind of is intuitive. So this is carbon dioxide, CO2. And the molecule that we get when we draw it out looks kind of like this, where we need two double bonds, one to one oxygen, one to another, to get this thing to work out. Each oxygen gets an octet, the carbon gets an octet. It's a good way to share electrons. Okay. Now, all these atoms, the carbon, the oxygen, and the oxygen, have their own valence electrons, which means they've got their own electron clouds. Now, electrons repel each other. They're all negative, so they're gonna kind of want to have their space. They wanna have their room. They're gonna push back against each other. So it wouldn't really make sense to put the oxygen atoms close to each other. Instead, it would make more sense to get them as far away from each other. In other words, if I were trying to line these guys up, and this is my carbon, this is my oxygen, and this is another oxygen, it wouldn't really make sense to do something like this because they're like way too close. Uh, they're going to repel each other. In fact, it would be way better if these guys were as far apart from each other as possible. So that is what we see in the actual kind of 3D structure of the molecule. Let me get those guys on there. Rotate this. And there we go. Okay, so this is the actual shape we get for carbon dioxide, which matches pretty well to what we've drawn. Okay, now some things don't exactly fit to what we draw because we're drawing on a flat surface, either a piece of paper or a screen or something like that, a whiteboard. So let's look at another example. So this is CH4, okay, carbon tetrahydride. If I try and look at kind of getting everything to be happy, the way I've drawn this out, these are about as far away as I can get these. They're about 90 degrees apart from each other. If you think of like the circle being 360 degrees, each one is a fourth of that, so 90 degrees apart from each other. And that seems like that's about as good as we can get. But what this is lacking is a third dimension. We can go kind of up this way or down that way and get things a little bit farther away from each other. So. We don't really end up with a structure like this, where these are all kind of 90 degrees apart from each other. Instead, we end up with something like this. Flip that over. This is what we call a tetrahedral shape. We have kind of like a tripod almost, and there's one thing on top. And it might seem like, oh, these are all kind of like, you know, different you know, kind of uh, distances apart, but if you go and rotate this, now you've got a new atom on top, and you can rotate it again, you've got a new atom on top. You always end up with the same shape no matter how you spin this around, okay? So these are actually 109.5 degrees apart, which is a little bit better than the 90 degrees. So this is the 3D shape that we actually get for carbon tetrahydride, for CH4. Not this sort of flat picture here. So sometimes to spread out atoms as far apart from each other as we can, the shapes get a little more complicated, which is why 3D models like this can be very helpful in understanding what molecules actually look like. Okay. Looking at another example here, we've got carbon double bonded to oxygen, then also bonded to two hydrogens. So we've got three things to bond to. So it makes the most sense to kind of spread them out evenly. And in this case, we can actually do it flat, where 120 degrees is as good as we can get these to be apart. Okay, and this is what the molecule basically looks like. There's a model of it. So I've got the double bonds, the oxygen up here in red. My hydrogen atoms are in white down here. And it basically fits that shape, where they're kind of out in a triangle. Okay, now what's weird is if I look at CH2, which is kind of an oddball, it has a lone pair of electrons that doesn't get used for anything. It just sits on the atom. 
And as you've drawn out structures for things with nitrogen in the center or phosphorus um, or even oxygen, um, you've probably noticed things like this where there are lone pairs of electrons that aren't used for bonding, which is fine. But this can change the shape of the molecule because this molecule does not look like a linear kind of path, which would make sense. You would think like, okay, I'm going to put these hydrogens out as far apart as they can from each other. So they would be in a straight line like this. But instead, they end up like, if I can scooch it over there. There we go. Like this. Like the way I've drawn it. Not in a straight line, but a little bit crooked from each other. So the question is, why do we end up with a bent shape even though there's nothing over here to kind of push these away? Well, there is. This lone pair of electrons is there, and it's a pair of electrons. They're going to repel just the same as the electrons in an atom or in a covalent bond being shared. So even though it doesn't take up physical space as an atom, this area where we're going to find electrons is just as likely to push other groups of electrons away. So the only thing that can, uh, the, the two things that affect molecular shape are going to be bonded atoms that are covalently bonded to the center atom and lone pairs of electrons that are also on that center atom. Okay, it's not just one or the other. Okay, so to generalize, we kind of group these two bonded atoms and lone pairs of electrons um, as electron domains. So whether we are dealing with you know, one of these guys or one of these guys, these are both domains where we're going to find electrons. They're both spots where we're likely to find electrons, and therefore they're going to repel each other. So we need to give them space. These just as much as these guys, and sometimes even a little bit more. Okay, so comparing these two now, this guy to this guy, whether we're looking at this one that has three bonded atoms and no lone pairs of electrons, or this guy over here, which has two bonded atoms and one lone pair of electrons, they both have three electron domains. Okay, In the case of our CH2, maybe one of these isn't an atom, but that's okay. So the molecule itself might look something like this, Okay, but these atoms are pushed there because of this extra pair of electrons that's sitting on the center atom. Okay, they have to have their space too. So we control, or rather we, we can figure out, we can determine the shape of a molecule based on how many electron domains there are around the center atom. Note that we don't include the center atom in how many bonded atoms there are. We're just saying how many atoms are bonded to the center. Okay? And our lone pairs of electrons also only count for the center atom. I don't really care if oxygen's got lone pairs up here. I want to know how this atom has bonds and um, lone pairs kind of arranged around it, not these other atoms up here. Okay, so whether I'm looking at this or this, they both have three electron domains, which is why they end up with very similar shapes. Okay, so this is how we can predict what the shape of a molecule is going to be. You don't always need a model kit around for you to, to kind of figure it out. If we can figure out how many bonded atoms or lone pairs of electrons are there, we can make a pretty good guess of how those are going to arrange around each other. What we usually end up caring about is where the atoms are at, but in order to know where the atoms are at, we need to know where those lone pairs of electrons are.